Good afternoon, everyone. As we wrap up this topic of psychoacoustics and begin discussing respiratory disorders and medical conditions impacting speech, I thought it would be fitting to have guest speaker Terry Lane, who is an adjunct instructor in the music department here at UNH, talk to you about a topic in which she brings a wealth of knowledge and passion, and that is how psychology can affect communication and the overall negative impact that can have on our lives. She will discuss with you how she fuses music and psychology to correct negative behaviors that are impediments to student development. There are many overlaps in Terry's philosophy and practice as an instructor of voice in our practice as speech and language pathologist, specifically in the treatment of fluency disorders in our field. I hope you find her lecture as fascinating and thought-provoking as I did. Thank you, Terry, for sharing your wisdom with all of us. Hi, everybody. I'm Professor Terry Lane, and I'm honored to be a guest lecturer in your course this semester. So I am on the faculty of the music department and have been teaching overall for 22 years now the last 12 here at UNH. I'm also a blues rock recording artist, singer, songwriter, and a music producer um, with over 70 rec records to my credit and counting. A little bit more about me is I love to play and watch tennis. I am a New York Giants uh, football fan. And a couple of years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I rescued a kitten that had been abandoned in my neighborhood. And she's two years old now. Her name is Cinnamon. And um, I also live just two miles away from campus, so I have a nice short commute to work. Uh, I just, just live a couple of blocks away from West Haven Beach. So the purpose of this lecture is to relate to you how our psychology can affect communication and how that can negatively impact our lives. I will also tell you about emotion regulation, unhealthy habits of mind, and how I fuse music and psychology to correct negative behaviors that are impediments to student development. Now, one of the courses that I teach is vocal performance, which is basically voice lessons for any ability level from beginner to advanced. Now, you may be wondering why I call myself the voice whisperer. Sounds kind of arrogant at first, like I'm another Cesar Milan, the dog whisperer. The truth is, one of my colleagues started calling me that years ago because of the many students I have helped overcome their fear of speaking or just using their voice, especially for music. Every semester, the majority of my students are dealing with some level of social anxiety and a lack of confidence in speaking for themselves. For some, the level of anxiety cripples them with fear, no exaggeration. So the word started getting around that I was working some kind of magic in my classroom. The truth is I'm not using magic. I'm using psychology to transform the minds of my students and that in turn transforms their inner and outer voices, leading to increased confidence in themselves, which coincides with healthier communication and relationships. So what is social anxiety? How does it develop? And why is it important that we learn about it today? Well, first let's take a look back in time at the behavior of adolescents. Up until the 2000s, social anxiety wasn't as prevalent as it is now. When I was in high school, most of us would not have a problem getting up in front of a class and reading an essay or whatever, talking to each other in groups, raising our hands in class to ask a question or to take a stab at answering the question of a teacher, or even just sitting down in the lunchroom and yakking away to whoever was sitting next to us, even if we didn't know them, just because we just felt like talking whatever we, want, we wanted to talk about. Sure, there were shy kids, and those of us who were shy usually grew out of it in time as we got a little bit older, started forming our own identities, and became emotionally more mature. So in trying to get to the root of where social anxiety comes from, here's one major contributor, 
technology. Now, there's no denying the positive impacts that digital technology has had on our lives, including in education. As much as we have benefited, there has been increasing research conducted over the past 20 years concerned with its negative effects, particularly on child and adolescent development, both psychologically and academically. In what is referred to as an addiction, people of all ages around the world constantly check their cell phones for messages, post to social media, and more. For adolescents, using digital technology has replaced face-to-face -face communication, a change that may have directly affected their ability to manage their emotions amid life's changes and challenges and to create and maintain healthy real world social relationships. In the classroom, that equates to silence. Adolescent and young adult voices are being lost because their anxiety about being among others in person has increased. This lack of voice and confidence is leading students to drop out of colleges and universities at rates never before seen. The youth of the world's futures should not be at risk due to technological advancement. So as the popularity, functionality, and use of smartphone technology has grown since the 2000s, so has the concern of impacts on the behavior and mental health of its users, especially adolescents. Of particular interest is the use of social media as there is a suspected link of excessive usage to increases in mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety, and thoughts of self-harming. So let's look at the positive and negative influences that technology and social media has had on student academic performance and success, as well as what effects these resources can have on the mental health and well-being of adolescents. Since smartphones became available, they have rapidly evolved into mini computers and enable users, they enable us to be connected 24 hours a day to news and other media, as well as to a network of family, friends, and coworkers. Facebook has taken the lead as a social networking site. But what was once seen as a way to stay in touch with friends and family and to make new friends gradually has become associated with higher levels of social anxiety. Now, social anxiety is defined as a, as a state of anxiety resulting from the prospect or presence of interpersonal evaluation in real or imagined settings. In other words, it's the fear of being judged. And then you have to think, are we really being judged? Or are we just imagining that we're being judged? In one research study that explored how human behavior may be influenced by the use of computers, the goal was to learn if adolescents were using technology as a way to avoid face-to-face -face interaction, in addition to discovering the reasons why. It was found that a group of high school participants in the study deliberately resisted person-to-person -person contact and preferred to communicate through email, text, text messaging, or posting on social media. Now, a person suffering from social anxiety may be depressed and will physically isolate themselves from others. For those that are shy, using technology gives them more of a sense of belonging by posting their news thoughts and feelings on social media, in addition to responding to others, to responding to posts by others in their network. However, more researchers have characterized technology and social media use as a growing addiction, as I said previously. At the time of the aforementioned study, it had already become a serious problem in the classroom as educators increasingly began to see lower participation, which continues today, and what is described as crippling anxiety when students were given an assignment that involved giving a presentation or performance. It is no exaggeration the impact anxiety has on them. 
from losing sleep and feeling ill before a presentation, or their cognition being affected to the point that even if they knew the answers to exam questions, the anxiety causes their minds to just go blank. Overall, students on university campuses have been seen to be struggling more with social interaction in and out of the classroom, with many using their cell phones during classroom lectures to play games, yep, <laughs> access social media, or text message their friends. In addition, it has grown evident that text messaging has diminished the writing skills of students, further reducing their ability to produce accept acceptable work in school. Now, as of 2020, social media users totaled 3 billion globally. It served a more positive purpose in its earlier history, providing users um, support and ways to relieve stress by talking about everyday life. More recently, users are bombarded with all manners of topics from politics to economics to social and personal issues that people are concerned with. A person could be in a great mood and then react negatively because of something they read on Facebook or even because they didn't get enough likes on a post. One study explored how students would compare themselves to others' accomplishments or actions and feel lower self-worth or have less confidence in themselves as a result of their own expectations. Even more concerning is that adolescents can have connections on social media with people they do not even know in real life. In fact, some users will add a lot of people, even in the, into the thousands, to their accounts to create the illusion that they are popular. Thus, they spend more time on their accounts looking for recognition or else responding to posts leading to lower productivity in and out of the classroom and becoming dependent on the constant feedback they desire to receive. Now, this is not to say that all social media and technology use is harmful. If it's used correctly and with proper expectations, Within these platforms lies the potential for those who may be dealing with mental health issues to find support within their networks or in private groups that are devoted to these issues. Now, what if a person has experienced trauma in their lives or if they have a learning disability, mental illness, physical disability, or a speech impediment? Coupled with social anxiety, they may isolate themselves even more from others and silence themselves due to their mindset being fixed on the negative, rather than seeing and realizing how much their voices matter. There is an old saying that our minds play tricks on us. So this image looks like it's moving. So I want you to just pick a, pick a purple oval and just stare at it. you'll notice that the other oval will stop moving. Now take your eyes off it and you it looks like it's moving. The reality is it's not moving. <laughs> it's, it's, just a, it's just a trick of the mind. So the point is, are some thoughts we think over and over real? And are the emotions that those thoughts create, are they reality? When it comes to social anxiety, and being afraid to speak to others face to face. What are we really afraid of? Here's the answer I've gotten the most when I've asked that question. I'm afraid I will say something stupid. What is the definition of stupid? Are you really deserving of saying that about yourself or even somebody that you know and care about? So I have a saying, fear is a useless emotion. I would like to tell you a little bit about emotional intelligence, but first, let's take a pause and do some writing and reflection. Create the three columns on a piece of paper. The left column, you will title useful emotions. In the middle, you have a column that will say both. And then the right column will be titled useless emotions. So again, column on the left, useful emotions. One in the middle is both. And then the one on the right, useless emotions. Write down as many good or useful 
emotions and bad useless emotions that you can think of and feel free to use the internet to find some more. In the middle column, put the ones that you think can be both good and ba bad or useless and useful. Pause the video here and then come back and we'll talk a little bit about how emotions can mess up your mind, your speech, and your life. Welcome back. Now here is the list I came up with. So go ahead and pause the video again so you can add these emotions to your lists. So now we're gonna talk about emotional intelligence and mindset. So the concept of emotional intelligence emerged in 1990 and examined how regulation and understanding of emotions in oneself and in others can lead to successful problem solving and more positive social relationships. That inspired Daniel Goleman to write his 1995 best-selling book that you see here. Previously, emotional intelligence was not part of the conversation regarding human growth potential, adaptability, conflict resolution, productivity, and success. As a, result, as a result of his notion of emotional hijacking, research continues to explore how a lack of emotional intelligence can lead to paralyzing behavior that affects one's ability to be a productive member of society. Now, I know I'm using strong words. Hijacking is a very strong, strong word, but it is essentially exactly what happens to us when our emotions take control of our minds. So let's look at how you as undergraduates are relevant to this topic. Consider the amount of stress a student may feel within the first year of college and the many factors that will contribute to anxiety becoming overwhelming to the point that a student feels they cannot overcome it. As Goldman stated, it has been found that anxiety undermines the intellect. Anxiety also sabotages academic performance of all kinds. 126 different studies of more than 36,000 people found that the more prone to worries a person is, the poorer their academic performance, no matter how that performance is measured, grades on tests, grade point averages, or achievement tests. Now, emotional intelligence is also known as EQ or emotional quotient. It can either be a natural part of your disposition, or it can be a learned coping mechanism. In other words, some people are just naturally able to, able to balance their emotions and think with their heads rather than their hearts. In a middle school study by psychologist and author Carol Dweck that incorporated her implicit theories of intelligence, which assesses beliefs about intelligence being fixed or changeable, the biological and neurological changes experienced by adolescents in puberty was incorporated into their analysis of adolescent perception of whether they can learn to manage their emotions with particular focus on how their environments, such as socioeconomic status, can influence those perceptions. Their results indicated that at this crucial time in an adolescent's development, students were apt to take on more challenges when their beliefs were strengthened about their own ability to manage stress and resulting emotions. This is so important regarding establishing peer relationships that lend social emotional support. They also considered how we are not all wired the same in our brains and that genetics can factor into how regulation of emotions can be controlled. And not everybody that learns to be emotionally intelligent can be a good problem solver. Some people are just not logical naturally. So the bottom line here is that increasing your EQ, your emotional quotient, 
is about managing your emotions so they don't manage you. And that is good advice for everybody. I refer to Carol Dweck because of her books about mindset. I recommend this book highly, Mindset, the New the uh, Psychology of Success. It costs less than $10 on Amazon. Put simply, fixed mindset equals I can't. Growth mindset equals I can. No versus yes. Just because we aren't naturally good at something doesn't mean we can't become good at something. You don't have to be born with talent to be a singer. You have to want to become a good singer, to be motivated to work hard at becoming a good singer. Some people say they aren't mechanically inclined or are not good with their hands. It's all about how you look at things and how you think about it. If you think you can't do something, guess what? You won't. <laughs> that leads me to how I get students past these psychological barriers to their musical development and success. So this is just another graphic in regard to you can see how fixed mindset means you're just locked in that negative space in your head and it creates all those negative emotions. And then the growth mindset, you're making something happen. You're growing, you're digging a, you're digging a hole, but you're creating something new. And that that's really, really important in life. So now we're gonna talk about psychology and the voice solutions. For anyone that uses their voice for a living or even as a hobby, proper voice training is a must to protect and develop it. The voice is a delicate instrument. Abuse of it could do permanent damage. So the two key technical mechanics of singing are breathing and vowel placement. The first things I teach are that every breath a student takes is a deep rib expanding breath to support the voice, every single breath. They also have to learn to control the amount of air that they use as the voice is dependent on the lungs being full enough to support it. The second thing is vowel placement. There are a lot of vowel sounds in language, but there are five tall vowel sounds a, A, E, O, and ooh, ooh. Now, those of you, if any of you have taken choir um, or any kind of music classes, even when you were younger, you're probably familiar with the A, A, E, O, O, because you might have done some warm ups with those vowels. Now, the main vowel is the A. Ah. Everything is about the space that the A ah creates. Opening the jaw to a comfortable A ah does the following it drops the tongue down and away from the upper palate and nose. So you don't sound like Fran Drescher when you sing very nasally. <laughs> that creates a more pleasing tone to the voice. It also creates space for sound projection. With the mouth more closed, not a lot of sound is going to come out and your vocal system will get tired pretty fast trying to push past that wall with your mouth closed. So the main benefit of creating the space with the ah vowel, opening the jaw, as you can see, these wonderful people here have a perfect ah space that they've created in their singing. Um, the main thing is you're opening up the throat, giving the vocal cords lots of room to expand as you sing higher and lower. Creating that space is the ultimate protector of the voice, no matter how you use it. Now, many actors are classically trained in voice. Imagine Robert De Niro doing a film where he is a disgruntled, angry guy who does a lot of yelling in it. See the funny film. There's a really funny film called Midnight Run that was uh, did, done years ago. Um, it's, there's a ton of yelling in this film. And many of the characters are angry at each other, screaming at the top of their lungs. Um, so not only does Robert De Niro have to rehearse that scene, if there's just just one scene where he's really angry and yelling, but when it comes time to shoot the scene, the director is going to require lots of takes to get it right, and that could take hours, hours and hours of yelling, open up and say, ah. So in teaching my vocal performance course, one key way I build trust and rapport with my students is by having a vast knowledge of music and staying current with what is on the music industry charts. 
I personalized each lesson by giving students a list of choices for each song assignment. And that could be something from the 60s or something from Adele's new album. This is aside from strategically designed vocal exercises that accelerate their memorization of the breathing and the vowels and proper execution, like I said, proper execution of the breathing and the vowel placement. So each song assignment and exercise are development tools that scaffold on the other and become more challenging. So as they grow, they can take on new challenges. The key is that the student feels emotionally connected to every song. Without that, I cannot eventually get them in the zone or in the place where they can disappear into the music and sing their hearts out. As the anxiety lessens, they put more energy into their singing. And that actually has a cyclical effect of building their vocal ranges and strength so they can just take on those new challenges. So as they grow, they get more confidence and then they put more into it. And it's just, just this constant cycle of positivity that happens. Now, there are many other methodologies that I use, but the goal is to get rid of the fear and the anxiety. By learning to sing, having music curriculum design with their identity in mind, becoming more knowledgeable about distorted perceptions and how they become hijacked by their thoughts and emotions, they become more confident human beings and emotionally stable. And thus, are better equipped to manage being in college and dealing in life with just dealing with life in general. I've actually had students tell me I changed their life. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful gift to be able to do that every day. So referring back to our useless and useful emotions exercise, the list that you made, here is a scenario of negative behavior modification through positive self dialogue. Now this is an actual conversation that I had with a student. So I'm gonna read, Ethan, I'm afraid to sing in front of you, me, why? I don't know. I can't teach you or help you if you don't sing. I don't know is not an answer I can work with. Try again. Why are you afraid to sing in front of me? What's the worst thing that's going to happen if you do? I promise I'm not going to throw up my lunch. Ethan laughs and says, I guess I'm afraid I'm not going to be perfect, that I'm going to mess up and sound bad. And I say, are you a master of the voice as an instrument like I am? And he said, he laughs again and says, no way. And I say, nobody is perfect at anything. I don't care if you hit a wrong note. It's normal if you do, as this is all new stuff you are learning. I'm here to help you correct those wrong notes and gain strength and flexibility so you can sing better, sound better, and feel better about your voice and yourself. So what do you think about that? Ethan says, that makes me think I should just do it and stop worrying about it. You're right. I can't get better if I don't sing and I should just focus on the techniques you're teaching me. As you said, that's what I need to do to get stronger. I just realized I'm creating a problem that doesn't exist. So I ask him, are you still afraid to sing for me? And he says, no, let's do this. <laughs> Love it. So in this case, fear, the useless emotion, becomes courage, determination, and interest, which are those useful emotions in the left column. After a time and with some work, Ethan will add, three more useful emotions, relief, happiness, and satisfaction. So what is metacognition? I just gave you an example of it, basically. It means thinking about thinking. <laughs> it actually means thinking about thinking. It is having an awareness of your thought processes and understanding why you are thinking what you are thinking. It's a way of seeing a bigger picture of your thoughts so that you can solve problems that stem from negative habits of mind. This is so, so important when it comes to managing your emotions. So here's another example that illustrates metacognition. 
Amanda is an algebra one. She thinks she is not good at math, so she's not doing well in the course and is falling behind. If she flunks it, she will have to take it again and she can't graduate without passing it. Here is how Amanda strengthened her metacognition with positive inner and outer speech, adopted a growth mindset, and took action to solve her problem. I am not a math person. I hate it. There is no way I'm going to pass this class and I can't even sleep. I feel sick because I'm so anxious. Why can't I understand this stuff? I'm not dumb. I'm doing well in my other classes. I've always been a pretty good student. I mean, I've heard other people say they don't get algebra either, but people pass it all the time. Now, what did the professor say? She has office hours and is here to help us whatever we need. There are also tutors. Wait, she said there's no such thing as being a math person. Everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. Why am I thinking that I hate math? Maybe that's my problem. I'm going about this the wrong way. If I can start to figure it out, then I won't hate it and I won't feel so anxious. I am making this worse than it has to be. Professors want us to pass, but if I don't ask for help, I won't get any. I'm gonna email her right now and schedule some time with her. There is no way I'm gonna lose another night's sleep over this. So here is a learning activity. Think of personal experiences in which you felt or feel one of the useless emotions on your list, especially fear. It is a common toxic emotion and causes us to physically feel stressed out, nervous, and anxious. It can stop us right in our tracks. How many times can you recall starting a sentence with, I'm afraid to? Our thoughts create our emotions and they can be reversed through positive self-dialogue. Write down an experience with whatever useless emotions you wish to transform. Then talk yourself through it and reverse your thinking to solve the problem. Eliminate the negative and find a useful solution that you can put into motion. So the, the point is, it's like what Ethan did. You know, Ethan and I had that conversation and it was a physical action that was happening. So it's not just sitting and thinking. It's, it's important to actually physically say the words or walk through them somehow, taking actual physical action. So pause the video right here and give some thought um, to this exercise. And when you're ready, hit the play button again and I'll conclude the lecture with some more information. As Franklin D. Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And doesn't that make so much sense with what we're talking about today? Now, referring back to my voice students, you can see now that anxiety alone will make it very difficult for me to train their physical instrument. The fear is like a vice grip on their muscles. Their minds are fixed on I can't but they voluntarily took the course because most of them have the same goal to overcome their fear of speaking and or singing. They want to be free to sing their heads off. They want to be able to get up in front of a class and not be dreading the experience. Think of how that would also affect a job interview. Freedom of speech is not just a constitutional right that we have. It's a necessary part of communication, relationships, being understood, and getting what we need to be happy and healthy. In using psychology, I find ways to distract students from their negative thoughts, getting them to be laser focused on doing. One way I distract them is to get them to mimic me by singing something with me exactly as I do it and as loud as I do it in a healthy way, of course. Previously, they may have said, I can't do it, it's too high for me. I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, obviously, I have determined what their vocal ranges are. 
So I know what they can handle. But again, there is that self-deception dialogue going on that creates the fear. I prove to them they can do it by having them do it with me several times. And then I trick them by pretending I'm going to sing again. And then they hear themselves do it alone. Proof is the truth. I have had so many students literally crying out of frustration when they first start lessons because they have either been told them, they've either told themselves um, things that undermine their confidence or else someone else they know has instilled that fear in them that has kept them silent. Your voice matters. So I will leave you with some pictures of students who I have, I have helped to find their voices and overcome that terrible, terrible anxiety and fear. Take good care of yourselves and have a wonderful day. And I'm so happy that I got to um, be with you today.